So I'm Professor Van Norden, and this is our lecture on the Confucian commentarial tradition. And our intro music again was John Thompson playing the Guqin, a, a zither that was uh, used as early as the time of Confucius, in fact, even earlier than that. Very few people today play the, the genuine Guqin. Uh, many people play related instruments like a jung or a samisen, but uh, people who play the Guqin are fairly rare. So if you're interested in music, maybe it'd be a fun uh, topic to explore. So didn't mean to restart that. So I want to start out by talking about or reviewing something I talked about in our first lecture, which is a common pattern that we see in many civilizations, not every single civilization, but this is something to keep in mind. It'll help you organize your understanding of uh, Western civilization, but you can also use this to help organize your understanding of East Asian civilizations, South Asian civilizations, because you do see a common pattern like this, where in ancient times, you get the formation of classic texts. And sometimes the, in some cases, the authorship of the text is unclear, or there are semi-mythical stories about the origin of the text. Other times we do know uh, who composed the text. But for example, in the European tradition, among the classic texts are the uh, Bible and the philosophical works of Plato and Aristotle. And there's a, a German philosopher, a 20th century German philosopher, Karl Jaspers, that's J-A-S-P-E-R-S. -E and he had an interesting theory about the Axial Age, a period in history where several civilizations independently came up with seminal texts and seminal movements. And the idea is they're axial, like an axis around which all the rest of history turns. And it's a, it's a controversial theory and some of the details are problematic. But it kind of points to the fact that in multiple places around the world, you have a period where early classic texts come into uh, existence and then help shape the later course of civilization. Then, and again, you see this in multiple civilizations, you get a period in which a lot of philosophy is done in the form of commentary on the classic texts. So the examples I gave here on the left, I've got a work by St. Augustine, and Augustine uh, synthesized the, the Bible as un understood by Christians with the teachings of Plato, the great ancient Greek philosopher. And a, a lot of what Augustine is writing is in the form of essentially commentary on the Bible as interpreted through another classic, other classic texts, the works of Plato. Later, in the European Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas comes around and Thomas Aquinas, a lot of his philosophy is in the form of commentary on the Bible, interpreting the Bible in the light of the thought of Aristotle. Now this is a great oversimplification, but it is true that you get this long period where people are doing philosophy via commentary. And it's important to recognize that these, this philosophy is extremely vibrant. And there's a lot of important disagreements within this tradition. So just because philosophy is written in the form of commentary doesn't mean it's not a vibrant tradition, it really is. And why do people end up writing philosophy in the form of commentary? Well, they find that the classic texts, in their opinion, give them deep insight into the nature of the world, but the language of the text is increase of the classic text is increasingly archaic and fewer and fewer people can read the language of the classic texts. In addition, you get new situations and people are unsure how to apply the classic text to new situations. And also you get disagreements about how to interpret the classics. And so these issues, just explaining the meaning of the classics and applying them to new situations and adjudicating disagreements about how to interpret the classics, this is why people write in this format of commentaries. Then when the modern era starts, people start to question the commentarial tradition. In some cases, people are questioning the commentaries, but they still see themselves as faithful to the teachings of the classics. So Descartes a nice example of this because people like Descartes and Thomas Hobbes, who are two very influential early modern philosophers, are challenging 
particularly the Aristotelian commentarial tradition on works like the Bible. And they're argue, they're not rejecting their own tradition, but they're saying that the commentarial tradition has misled people. But then also with modernity, you get some people who have a more radical critique of the classical tradition. For example, in the Western tradition, Nietzsche questions the value of the entire tradition, not just the commentarial tradition, but even the value of the, the foundation of classics, like the works of Plato and Aristotle and the Bible itself. And as I say, you get this the same pattern in other civilizations. So for example, in South Asia, which includes India, you have a period where there are these, the formation of great classic texts like the Bhagavad Gita, which is a wonderful, it's a, it's a brief but fascinating work and it's available in multiple translations and I'd, I'd recommend reading it as part of your general education. Um, but then other classic Indian works include the, uh, the Upanishads, and, and here the example I give is the Nyaya Sutra, which um, are the foundational texts of the Nyaya philosophical tradition. But then likewise, you get this, this later tradition of commentaries explaining what the classics are saying, explaining the language, adjudicating, disagreeing the text to new situations. So uh, that uh, on the left here is an example theory on the Bhagavad Gita. On the right, you can't see the, the title of that work very clearly, but it's a collection of the Nyaya Sutras with interpretive commentaries by later philosophers. Then when India encounters modernity, again, you find similar kinds of patterns. You have some people like Gandhi, who in a way are traditionalists. They want to reach back to the classics, but they think that the classics have often been misinterpreted. But you also get people like Ambedkar, who was a contemporary of Gandhi, not as well known in the West, but Gandhi wanted a more radical rejection of the, the Hindu tradition and was willing to question the authority of, of the classics um, that had been handed down for him and the entire social structure that went with them. You find a similar pattern in the Chinese tradition where you find the foundational classics, you find commentaries that are explaining the language of the classics, that are adjudicating disagreements about how to interpret the classics and that are also are trying to apply the classics to new situations. And this is a really vibrant tradition. Just like a side note here, one of the things that's characteristic of modernity is people tend, modern thinkers often are very dismissive of the commentarial tradition. And they say, oh, the commentators are just, they're not thinking for themselves. They're just, you know, repeating what the classics say. But interpreting the classics is itself a creative action. And even in the modern era, thinkers in the modern era are themselves still influenced by earlier thinkers, even when they, they claim to, sometimes modern works of philosophy are really just commentaries on other modern philosophers, um, even while in some ways people are, have been very uh, dismissive of the commentarial tradition. So today we're gonna to be looking at how this commentarial tradition works in China. Now we said in an earlier lecture that in the Han Dynasty, the Confucian curriculum coalesced around the five classics, the Wu Jing, and these are uh, the odes or classic of poetry, the Shi Jing, the documents or classic of history, the Shu Jing, also called the Shang Shu, the classic of changes, um, the Yi Jing. Sometimes uh, people pronounce that in English as I Ching. The pronunciation's wrong, but you might have heard people refer to the I Ching. That's what they're referring to. And we'll talk about the Yi Jing some more in a later lecture. The rites or record of rites, the Li Ji or Zhou Li, and the spring and autumn annals. Um, and some of these works, you can guess what they are. The Odes is a collection of poetry. The Documents is a collection of historical documents, especially speeches attributed to ancient rulers. The Changes is originally a divination manual, but one that has philosophically important appendices to it. The Rites, most of the Rites is what it seems like, a collection of uh, rituals for various situations. The Spring and Autumn Annals, we looked at that in the case of Dong Zhong Shu. It's a cryptically terse historical chronicle, but there are also these commentaries on the Spring and Autumn Annals. And 
uh, some people believe that the, the traditional view was that somehow Confucius had written the Spring and Autumn Annals and had encoded in subtle choice of language his moral judgments on the situation in, in the political and ethical uh, dilemmas in his era. So you can use it as a source of ethical guidance. The, um, and like I say, even if you read classical Chinese, these works are often very hard to read. Their ethical lessons are often kind of op opaque. They're hard to understand. So one of the things that happens with the Neo-Confucian movement of the Song and later dynasties is they don't reject the five classics, but they suggest that your education as a Confucian should focus, start on and focus on the four books, the Su Shu, and the four books are the Analects, the Great Learning, the Mean, and the Mengzi. And what are these works? The Analects is the sayings and brief dialogues of Kongzi, better known in the West by the Latinization of his name Confucius and his immediate disciples. The Great Learning is supposedly an opening statement by Kongzi with a commentary on it by his immediate disciple Tsungzi. The mean or the doctrine of the mean is a discussion of ethics and metaphysics attributed to Zhu Su, who was both Kongzi's grandson, but also himself a disciple of Zhengzi, who was Kongzi's disciple. And then the Mengzi is the sayings and dialogues of Mengzi, sometimes known by the Latinization that his name mentions. And he was a disciple of Zhu Su, or some sources say a disciple of a disciple of Zhu Su. So as Zhu Xi understood it, the four books give you this transmission of a unified Confucian way from Confucius himself to his immediate disciple, to his grandson, who was also a disciple of one of his disciples, and then another disciple of one of Confucius's uh, grand grandson and disciple of a disciple. So you get this nice kind of transmission of the Tao. This is historically a little questionable, but this is what Zhu Xi believed and what many people in the Chinese tradition believe. Now, this is part of Mengzi 2A6, a very famous passage in the Mengzi with Jushi's commentary on it. And this is from, I copied this from a, a book I have in, in my library, I have several copies of this book. It's, it's part of Jushi's Su Shu Ji Ju, the collected commentaries on the four books. And this is a page from the commentary on Mengzi 2A6. So, and what you'll notice here is in classical Chinese is written from top to bottom, and then the columns go from right to left. So that's how you would traditionally write something. And you notice you've got big characters here at where, that take up a whole column, and then you've got smaller characters that, take, that are written in two columns under the main column. The big characters, that's the text of the original classic, in this case, the Mengzi. So what I've done here is I've circled the big characters so you can see what those are. So that's the text of Mengzi 2A6. And then the smaller characters in double columns, that's Jushi's commentary on it. And so you can immediately visually distinguish the main text from the commentary. Now, the, the selections from the Confucian commentaries that we've given you are in our text, T. Walton Van Orden, Readings of Later Chinese Philosophy. How did we visually distinguish the classic from the commentary here? Well, the, in the selections from the collected commentaries on the four books, the text of the original classic is in boldface. So in other words, the things I've circled here in boldface, those are the things that are in the Mengzi in this case. And then the regular font underneath them, that's Jushi's commentary. So I've circled in blue where Jushi's commentary here is. Now there's a handful of places in this section of the book where you've got translator's notes or a translator's introduction written in italics. And so, for example, on this page, the footnotes here at the bottom are circled in green. That's from the translator, who in this case is me. And the, it, technically speaking, the my comments as a translator are a sub-commentary, because you can have a classic text, a commentary, and then you can also have a sub-commentary. 
Um, and you'll find this in some, some Chinese text. So technically my notes in the introduction are a sub-commentary on Zhu Xi's commentary on the original classic. But the reason I'm spending so much time on this is we often find that students aren't used to reading or writing about commentaries. And so they get confused about who's speaking. So always make sure you know, am I quoting Mengzi? Is it Mengzi says this? Or is this something Zhu Xi says? Or is this something that the translator is saying? So make sure you're attributing things to the right person. It's also just good advice in life to be clear, whatever career you're in, you wanna be clear about who said what. You know, did the president say this? Did the secretary of state say this? Did the, you know, uh, press secretary say this, who exactly said something, it's important to be clear about that. So in the, the, the next uh, part of the lecture, I'm going to give you several examples from uh, three of the four books to illustrate what the original texts are like and how those texts are handled by Zhu Xi and his commentary. Now, according to Zhu Xi, the earliest of the four books is the Analects because it's the sayings of Confucius and his immediate disciples. But Zhu Xi recommends that advanced students begin their studies with the Great Learning. And this uh, a scroll showing the text of the Great Learning is the image there. And remember, the Great Learning is supposedly an opening statement called the classic section attributed to Kungzu or Confucius. And then the rest of it, according to Zhu Xi, is a commentary on what Confucius said by Zhengzi, who was an immediate disciple of Confucius. So this is how they understood the text. So if you, if you look on, beginning on page 187 in our textbook, Readings in Later Chinese Philosophy, you'll see that the text of the Great Learning opens with the following line, which again is attributed to Confucius. The way of great learning lies in enlightening one's enlightened virtue. That is as puzzling an opening line in classical Chinese as it would be for you now. Like, well, what do you mean the way of great learning lies in enlightening one's enlightened virtue? And if your virtue is enlightened, why do you have to enlighten it? And what does it mean to enlighten? What does it mean for it to be enlightened? Well, if you read Zhu Xi's commentaries, this is what he explains. So let's take the phrase great learning. In his commentary, um, and you can look on, if you want, look on page 187 in T. Walton Van Norden, you can follow along. Zhu Xi explains that great learning means the learning of an adult. So Zhu Xi thought that in ancient times, there were two levels of education. Little children started out taking the lesser learning, the xiaoxue, and they would learn things like reading, writing, arithmetic. They learn etiquette. Um, you know, they would learn a little bit of physical education. They learn some archery and some charioteering as kind of phys ed. Um, they learn, you know, a little bit of artistic things. They learn how to play music. They learn calligraphy, and this is the lesser learning. Then the students who showed talent, um, in, even if they were the children of, you know. Uh, peasants or farmers or people who weren't very, uh, didn't have very high social status, they would be sent to the school of the greater learning or the great learning to get a higher education. So that's what he means by saying the great learning is the learning of the adult. And he, and Jushi thinks that this text, the great learning, was the primary beginner's text in the ancient schools of great learning. I think I mentioned this before, but the term great learning in Chinese, da xue becomes the term for universities in later Chinese. So that kind of makes sense. If you can think about it, great learning is like university education or college education. What is enlightened virtue? Zhu Xi explained enlightened virtue contains the entire pattern so that it can respond to the myriad kinds of situations. However, it's darkened due to the restrictions caused by our endowments of qi and the obscurations of human desires. So as I explained in a previous lecture, Neo-Confucians like Zhu Xi think that there are two aspects to reality. There is the pattern, the structure of the universe, which is fully present in each thing that exists. And then there's qi, 
the stuff, the spatiotemporal stuff that makes up an individual things, that makes individual things individuals as their chi. So Jushi thinks that what the opening of the great learning is saying is that you have the pattern inside of you, it's in your mind, in a way the complete structure of the universe is present within you already, but that structure has to be embodied in your chi and that chi, if it's turbid, can block your understanding of the pattern. And the way, there's like two ways you can look at it. You can look at it objectively as the fact that the turbid chi blocks your vision, your understanding of the pattern. But you could also look, up, look at it subjectively or phenomenologically and say that, well, if your chi is turbid, what that means is you're going to have lots of selfish human desires. And they use the term human desires run you or selfish desires su you to identify those desires that block your understanding of morality because they're selfish um, and they're, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're the result of the turbid chi that you've got. Well, then how do you enlighten your enlightened virtue? Jushi says the enlightenment of virtue's fundamental substance is never extinguished. Hence, learners should follow its manifestations and thereupon enlighten it in order to return to its beginning. So you take the things you already understand and you use that as a basis for uncovering more of the pattern within you that is partially obscured by the turbid chi that makes you up. And an analogy I like to use to explain this is having a fish tank, where if you don't run your filters or if you let your filters get clogged, the tank is gonna get a lot of algae and there'll be fish in there and there'll be any objects you put in there, but you won't be able to see them clearly because the water will be turbid because of all the algae. But if you run the filters, or you replace the uh, dirty filters with clean filters, the water will become super clear and you'll be able to see everything perfectly. This is a metaphor for the process of ethical cultivation. We, almost all of us, start off with kind of turbid chi, which prevents us from seeing the moral pattern of the universe, even though that moral pattern is fully present within our mind. But through ethical cultivation, both the lesser learning and then studying the greater learning, we can clarify our chi and come to see the pattern more clearly. And one way Jushi puts this in the categorized conversations, uh, a work we talked about last week is, he says, well, the pattern is in the chi like a bright jewel is in water. Pattern in clear chi is like a jewel in clear water. Its brightness is fully visible. Pattern in turbid chi is like a jewel in turbid water. You cannot see its brightness outside. So the entire moral pattern, the entire structure of the universe is present within you, but it's obscured by the, your chi, which for most of us is very turbid. Um, and the idea is that differences in individual character are also due to chi. So some of us are quick learners like my daughter, is a very quick student and she's always had a very kind of placid, you know, easygoing personality. Other people like me, um, you know, I tend to have, uh, you know, it's a little harder for us to learn. We have to work more at it. We're, you know, prone to um, irritability and getting angry about things. And this is something that I had to work on to make myself more calm, more relaxed because I have this turbid chi that I've got to work through. But both of us can become better people by refining our chi through ethical cultivation and seeing the pattern more clearly, although it's going to be easier for some of us and harder for others of us. Another way Jushi puts this is he says, there's only one overarching pattern within heaven and earth. Human nature is just the pattern. The reason that there are good people and bad people is simply due to the clear or turbid embodied chi with which each is endowed. And that might seem like it relieves you of responsibility 
for being a bad person because what if I'm just given bad chi? But part of being a human being, according to Ju Shi, is having this capacity to refine your chi so that you can see the pattern more clearly. Now I'm gonna turn to another of the four classics, the Mangza, to, to better explain some of the ideas that we just saw in the great learning. So again, from the great learning, this basic idea that you've got the pattern within yourself, but it's obscured by your endowments of chi, which result in selfish human desires that you have to overcome. But through the ethical cultivation process, you can clarify your chi. Well, how does this work? And so how do I start from the parts of the enlightened virtue that are already clear to me to get to other parts of enlightened virtue that are not clear to me yet? So Mungza 1A7 says, treat your elders as elders and extend it to the elders of others. Treat your young ones as young ones and extend it to the young ones of others. Then you can turn the whole world in the palm of your hand. So that's from part of Mungza 1A7, which is a really fascinating passage in the Mungza. And then what does Jushi say in his commentary? He says, well, to treat as elders is to serve them in the manner that elders should be served. Your elders is your own father and elder brothers. The elders of others are the fathers and elder brothers of other people. To treat as young ones is to nurture them as one should nurture young ones. Your young ones means your own children and younger brothers. The young ones of others means the children and younger brothers of other people. So the idea is that at some level, everybody understands that you should respect the elders in your own family. And then, so that part of the pattern is going to be clear to most people. But then you have to realize, well, since I should respect the elders in my family, I should also respect the elders in other people's family. And so when I encounter an older person, uh, I mean, I'm kind of an older person myself, but when I encounter an even older person, part of what I think is, you know, this person's old enough to be my, my mother or my father. And I should treat them the way I would hope other people would treat my mother and father. And I've got kids of my own, although they're adults now, like you guys, but still I've raised children and I realized I should care for my children. But when I encounter other people's kids, um, I think about, well, these, you know, are young enough to, to be my kids or my grandkids someday. And I should treat them in the way that I hope other people will treat my children or my grandchildren someday. So you extend from the parts of the pattern that you already understand to the parts of the pattern that you don't understand. And Jushi's commentary continues, in general, relatives of the same flesh and blood fundamentally have one and the same chi. So in other words, just you think about it, there's something material in common between my parents and me and something material in common between me and my children. So, no kidding, because we're biologically related. And so he says, and so that you have this in common, you have common chi and are not merely like other humans of the same kind as us. Hence, the ancients needed to first extend from being kind to their kin and only then reach to being benevolent to the people. Only when they had a surplus of compassion to extend would they reach to being sparing of animals. In all cases, one extends from what is near to what is far. One extends from what is easy to what is difficult. In the present case, and he's talking about the, the discussion in 1A7, the king has reversed this. So the, I, the idea here, and, and for a lot of us, this is part of what was really philosophically very exciting about Confucianism is it's got a theory. You might agree with it, you might disagree with it, but it has a theory of how you get to be a better person. Suppose you wanted to become a better person, how would you do it? The Confucians and the Neo-Confucians explain what they find in the earlier Confucian texts, which is a whole theory of ethical cultivation, where you start from the things you understand, where you have the right feelings and you have the right attitudes, and you extend from the cases where you have the right feelings and you have your right attitudes to the cases where maybe you don't have them yet. So you naturally have love and respect for your parents. And so you should extend that to the 
uh, older people who are not your parents. You naturally love your own younger family members, including your own children. You extend that love to other children who maybe aren't a member of your family. And ultimately you extend it even to non-human animals, but that's a further extension of your love of other beings. And so this is a, it's an interesting idea that you can extend your compassion by seeing the similarities between your elder people in your family and the older people in other people's families. So if I think about the older people I meet as like my parents whom I love and respect, or I think about a child um, in the street as like my own children, I try to care for them and love them the way I would, analogous to the way I would care for my own uh, children. Or, uh, you know, I have pets now, and one of the reasons older people like me get pets is, you know, it, it becomes a child substitute. So we care for the dog and the cat the way I care, pay, cared for our children who are now grown up and out of the house. And so you're ex always extending your compassion to new things. Now, the idea that you can extend compassion to new things suggests that you have to start from reactions you've already got. And the Confucians have already given us one example. It's like, well, you love and respect your parents and you love and respect the younger children in your family. So you should extend that to older and younger people outside your family. But one of the most famous examples in the Mengza is in passage 2A6. And so uh, let's read this together. And here I'm just gonna read to start out with the original text of Mengzi 2A6, which is spread out over several pages in readings in later Chinese philosophy because I include the commentary with it. But the original passage starts out, Mengzi said, humans all have minds that are not unfeeling towards others. The former kings, the sage kings of the past had minds that were not unfeeling toward others. So they had governments that were not unfeeling toward others. If one puts into practice a government that is not unfeeling toward others, by means of a mind that is not unfeeling toward others, bringing order to the whole world is in the palm of your hand. So this makes clear that for Confucians, politics is an extension of ethics. So one of the major trends in political theory is to see politics as an extension of ethics, there's an alternative trend, which is to see politics as fundamentally divorced from ethics. And one of the things that's significant about thinkers like Thomas Hobbes or Machiavelli, two of the foundational figures in modern political philosophy, um, is that at least on one way of reading what they're doing, they're separating morality from political theory. And you have to decide for yourself which sort of political theory do you favor. But for Confucians, political theory is inextricably tied to ethics. So the Mengzi continues, the reason why I say that humans all have minds that are not unfeeling toward others is this. Suppose someone suddenly saw a child about to fall into a well. Anyone would have a mind of alarm and compassion not because one sought to get in good with a child's parents, not because one sought fame among their neighbors and friends, and not because one would dislike having a bad reputation. So the claim here is that any normal human being, if all of a sudden they were confronted with the sight of a child about to fall into a well, they would have a feeling of alarm and compassion, and this wouldn't be for ulterior motives. The idea being that your reaction is so sudden you don't have time to calculate how you might benefit by saving the child or what it would mean to you as an individual if you save the child. You only have time to react to the danger the child is in. And this compassion, amongst the things, shows something interesting about human nature. From this, we can see that if one is without the mind of compassion, one is not a human. And he adds, if one is without the mind of disdain, one is not a human. If one is without the mind of deference, one is not a human. If one is without the mind of approval and disapproval, one is not a human. The mind of compassion is the beginning of benevolence. The mind of disdain is the beginning of righteousness. The mind of deference is the beginning of propriety. The mind of approval and disapproval is the beginning of wisdom. So we get the four cardinal virtues of the Confucian tradition, benevolence, righteousness, wisdom, and propriety. The cardinal virtues are either the most important virtues in a tradition or more technically, they're the virtues that kind of subsume all the other virtues. If you had these four virtues fully, you'd have to have all the virtues because other virtues are just special cases of these four virtues. 
And this becomes a very influential list in the, the Chinese, especially the Neo-Confucian tradition, benevolence, righteousness, wisdom, propriety. And Mengzi suggests that each virtue is associated with a characteristic emotional reaction. And he says, people having these four beginnings is like they're having four limbs. To have these four beginnings, but to say of oneself that one is unable to be virtuous is to steal from oneself. To say that one's ruler is unable to unable is to steal from one's ruler. In general, having these four beginnings within oneself, if one knows to fill them all out, it will be like a fire starting up, a spring breaking through. If one can merely fill them out, they will be sufficient to care for all within the four seas. If one merely fails to fill them out, they'll be insufficient to serve one's parents. So this notion of filling out or extending them, again, it's this idea that everybody's going to have some situations where they will spontaneously manifest compassion. That is your virtuous nature, the pattern within you manifesting itself. The trick is to extend from the cases where you have the appropriate feelings and you have the appropriate perceptions to other cases where you don't yet have the appropriate feelings and the appropriate reactions. So learn to care, not just for this child falling into the well, but also for a child who maybe is malnourished. They're not falling into a well, but maybe they're malnourished. Or care for the child who doesn't have good educational opportunities or care for the child who's raised in an environment of, of violence and crime and so they don't have a chance to develop their own virtuous nature. Uh, care for them as much as you care for the more compelling immediate case of the child about to fall into a well. So extend by recognizing the similarity from this case to an analogous case. So what does Ju Xi say about this? Well, in uh, within 2A6, there's the passage that reads, from this we can see that if one is without the mind of compassion, one is not a human. If one's without the mind of disdain, one is not a human. If one is without the mind of deference, one is not a human. If one is without the mind of approval and disapproval, one is not a human. Ju Xi explains in his commentary what each of these key terms means. He's explained what compassion means in an earlier part of the commentary. So here he explains disdain is being ashamed of one's failure to be good and hating what is not good in others. So in other words, disdain isn't just a non-moral disgust or a non-moral kind of shame. Disdain is particularly being ashamed of one's own failure to be good. So you don't do things. And we, from examples he gives in other passages, a person should disdain to cheat in a game or uh, disdain to lie to others, to manipulate them. And if you have that kind of attitude in the right situations, that's the virtue of righteousness. Deference is to decline being relieved of a responsibility and to grant things to others. So in other words, it's things like, oh no, I'm not gonna have the last piece of cake, you have it. Or, oh no, let me carry that, grandmother. You don't have to carry it, I'll carry your bag for you. Approval is when you know that something is good and regarded as right. So again, approval and also disapproval is when you know that something is bad and regarded as wrong. Both approval and disapproval are connected to moral evaluations. They're not just a general approval or disapproval, they're specifically moral. What makes up a person's mind <clears throat> does not go beyond these four. Hence, he enumerated all of them after discussing compassion. The verse means that if a person lacks these, then he's not worth being called a human. And by means of this, it makes clear that one must have them. So if you imagine a person who lacked compassion, who lacked disdain, who lacked deference, who lacked any sense of approval and disapproval, they'd really be a sociopath, right? I mean, it would be somebody who couldn't feel compassion for the suffering of anyone else, who couldn't be ashamed of anything, right? So these are part of what we think is important to being a human being, not just looking like a human being, but actually having the emotions, the morally informed emotions that are part of being a human being. Another part of the passage in the Mengzi says, the mind of compassion is the beginning of benevolence. The mind of disdain is the beginning of righteousness. The mind of deference is the beginning of propriety. The mind of approval and disapproval is the beginning of wisdom. 
So Jushi explains, compassion, disdain, deference, and approval and disapproval are feelings or emotions. Benevolence, righteousness, propriety, and wisdom are the nature. And what is the nature? Part of what we learned from the great learning is your nature is the pattern. And the pattern is good, but it can't always fully manifest itself because sometimes the, your chi is turbid. So compassion, disdain, deference, approval, and disapproval are feelings or emotions. Benevolence, righteousness, propriety, and wisdom are virtues, and those virtues are your human nature. The mind is what links the nature and the feelings. So kind of where the pattern interacts with the chi, that's where the mind, we identify the mind as being. The, the, the mind, the human mind is where nature and feelings overlap. And then he says something really interesting. He says, this term that I've translated here, and I, in my translation, I'm following Ju Shi since I'm giving his interpretation. He says, beginning means tip. So what Jushi's saying is that these feelings manifested in your mind, like compassion, disdain, deference, approval, and disapproval, they're the beginnings of the virtue. And But what does the word beginning mean? Jushi says, beginning means the tip. By following the expression of the feelings, one can succeed in seeing the fundamental state of the nature. It's like when there's a thing inside something, but the tip is visible outside. So think of the classic cartoony image of a hastily packed uh, piece of luggage where there's clothes hanging out of the luggage. And so now if you look here, you can see that I know, for example, that there are some shirts in this piece of luggage. How do you know there are shirts in there? Well, I know there's a, there's a blue shirt and there's kind of an orange shirt. Why? Because I can see the tips of the clothing sticking out of the hastily packed bag. So likewise, Ju Shi says, when you have compassion for a child about to fall into a well, or when you instinctively love and respect your parents, or when you instinctively care for and love your younger siblings or your nephews or nieces or whatever. This is the tip of your fully formed virtuous nature showing. And by looking at that tip, we can infer what the rest of your nature is like. A similar metaphor you could use, it's not the one that Jushi uses, but one that one of my teachers used, is to say, well, it's kind of like the feeling of compassion or maybe you have, maybe you disdain to cheat at golf. Um, and so you're unwilling, you just have an instinctive aversion to cheating in a game like golf or cheating at Monopoly, something like that. That's like the tip of a fully formed moral iceberg. I don't know if you know this about icebergs, I, I guess most people do, but even though icebergs look huge and they are huge, only a small part of the iceberg is visible above the surface of the water. Most of the iceberg is beneath the water. You can only see the tip of the iceberg. So what Jushi is saying is that your feeling of compassion for a child about to fall into a well, or um, your uh, disdain to accept being treated disrespectfully by someone else, or you're, maybe you disdain to cheat in a game, uh, or something like that, or you disdain to lie to somebody to manipulate them. Whatever the reaction is that you have, that is the tip of a fully formed virtuous nature that you have within you. But what's concealing most of that nature is your turbid chi, which is preventing you from manifesting it. So what you want to do is you want to open the piece of luggage by clarifying your chi, or you want to get rid of the water to reveal the entire moral iceberg so that the pattern is completely visible in you. And that's what it's like to be a sage. So that's one interpretation, and it's a very plausible, it is a plausible interpretation. But I want to point out uh, another way you might read the passage. So the word that gets translated as beginning here, and I translated it as beginning because I'm following Jushi's interpretation because I'm translating the text with Jushi's commentary. But for me, when I look at this character, 
I wonder, does it mean tip or is it possible it means sprout in this context? Now the character here, Duan has two parts. The left-hand part of it is a character which means to stand, but the right-hand part of the character is actually a, a, a seldom used character that means sprout. And if you look at an early form of the character, or if you know something about Chinese characters on the lower right here, this is the small seal form of the character, which is the small seal forms are seldom used today, but they show the earlier, in many cases, the earlier form of the character. And you can get a better sense of what the character refers to sometimes by looking at the small seal form. And if you look there, if you, you realize that this character is actually originally a pictogram of a sprout. And you've got the roots beneath ground, you've got the ground line, and then you have the leaf starting to sprout above the surface. Now, I want you to know, uh, most Chinese characters are not pictures of something. And so I don't mean to give you the impression that every Chinese character is a picture or that you can just read the meaning of the character off of it. In fact, the vast majority of Chinese characters are semantic phonetic compounds. And if you're curious about this, I talk about this in a, in a couple of my, my other books. There's a section about this in uh, Introduction to Classical Chinese Philosophy. And there's also a section on this in the introduction to my Classical Chinese for Everybody. So if you wanna learn more about how Chinese characters works, work, go to one of those books. But, but in this case, the right-hand part of this character is a pictogram of a sprout. And it's very clear, especially in the small seal form, if you just compare it to an image of a sprouting plant. So, but what difference does it make whether we think of this word duan as referring to a beginning in the sense of a tip of something or a beginning in the sense of a sprout? It could make a big difference because what it means is when we understand what a person's moral nature is like, do we understand every human being as having a fully formed, complete, virtuous nature already present within them that just needs to be exposed by getting rid of selfish thoughts and turbid chi? Or do we think humans are born just with a capacity, an active but incipient tendency towards virtue that's fragile like the sprout of, sprout of a plant and has to be cultivated like the sprout of a plant to eventually grow into a fully developed virtue. That's gonna give you a different perception of what the average person's moral capacity is like, whether you use the tip metaphor or the sprout metaphor. And it's also going to affect what you think you're doing when you're engaging in ethical cultivation. Are you exposing something that's already fully there are you discovering something that's already fully there? Or are you developing something that's there, but only potentially? So that's an interesting interpretive disagreement there where I think, I don't think I agree with Zhu Xi. I think that beginning here means sprout, not tip, but uh, it just shows the way you can think about some interesting issues as you argue with the commentarial tradition and try to decide whether you agree with it or really which of the various different commentarial traditions you're agreeing with. Because there are other commenta commentators in the Chinese tradition who, like me, read this word as sprout rather than as tip. Now let's move on to the Analects of Confucius, the sayings attributed to Confucius and his immediate disciples. So, uh, supposedly composed soon after the death of Confucius. Here's a passage that it's a very brief passage in book 17 in the Analex. The Analex passage 17.2 is just the bold face part here. The master said, natures are close to one another, but by practice, they become far apart from one another. This passage really puzzled and intrigued Neo-Confucian commentators like Chu Xi. It doesn't seem like it should be that controversial, right? But we're gonna see why this bothered them. And notice it's a brief passage and a surprisingly long commentary on it. So the master said, natures are close to one another, but by practice, they become far apart from one another. In his commentary, Jushi says, when this passage refers to natures, it is discussing them in terms of embodied dispositions. 
right? Literally what it says is your, um, your uh, material chi, right? Embodied natures certainly have some differences between the fine and the bad. Nonetheless, at the beginning, they're not very far from each other. But if one's practices are good, one becomes good. And if one's practices are bad, one becomes bad. Thereupon, they begin to be far from one another. Cheng Yi said, so this is Zhu Xi quoting Cheng Yi, an earlier Neo-Confucian philosopher whom Zhu Xi respected a lot. Cheng Yi said, this passage is discussing embodied natures. It is not discussing the fundamental nature. If one discusses what is fundamental, the nature is simply the pattern. The pattern never fails to be good. This is what Mengzi meant by human nature is good. How could they merely be close to one another? So what does all this mean and why is this passage bothering them so much? Well, look at it this way. In the Confucian tradition, we really find three major statements on human nature. In the Analects, in this passage that we just looked at, Confucius is quoted as saying, natures are close to one another, but by practice, they become far from one another. But Mengzi, who is the supposed author of another of the four books, said simply, natures are good. Now remember, Zhu Xi thinks that the four books is the transmission of a common Confucian way from master to disciple across several generations. So he thinks that what they're saying has to be consistent. But Mengzi says that human natures are good, full stop, without qualification. So it was really puzzling why Confucius would say that natures are merely close to one another and how they could become far from one another. Because if the natures are good, and if saying the nature is, is good is the definitive statement on human nature, well, the natures aren't merely close to one another, they're identical and they don't become farther apart from one another because they're identically good. So the solution that Zhu Xi gets from this earlier philosopher Cheng Yi is, well, you need to understand, Mengzi is talking about the nature in itself, which is pure pattern. And as pure pattern, our fundamental underlying nature is good and it's identical across all human beings whether you're an evil person like Robert Jur, or you're a sage like Confucius, or you're a middling person like Van Norden, your fundamental underlying nature is pure pattern, and that's identical in everybody, and it's equally good. So that's what Mengzi means when he says nature is good. What Confucius is talking about is he's talking about your nature as embodied in your chi. But some people's chi is more turbid than other people's chi. So since we're all humans, in order to be a human, your chi has to be kind of similar to other people or you wouldn't be human. So your embodied nature as a human being is similar to the embodied nature of other people. The embodied nature of Robert Jur and Confucius and Van Norden is all similar because we're all humans. But the embodied nature of Confucius became really virtuous because his chi was highly purified. And Van Norden's purified his chi a little bit. So he's a little bit, you know, better than he was to start out with. He overcame a little bit of his tendency to get overly frustrated and angry and impatient with things. And so Van Norden's gotten a little bit better, whereas Robert Jurors just allowed him to become more and more turbid um, and just to become worse and worse. So the solution to how to reconcile these two statements in canonical texts is to say, well, they're not talking about the same thing, although they're both using the word nature. Mengzi is talking about human nature in itself, fundamental human nature. Kungza or Confucius is talking about nature as manifested in your chi. And in that it is true of the nature as manifested in the chi that it's similar among humans but differs in terms of how much you clarified your chi to reveal the pattern and to make yourself virtuous. And this Zhu Xi's interpretation becomes embodied in this elementary text 
that some people even today will teach this to their children. You can get recordings of this to teach to your children. I actually had parts of the three character classic written on the wall of my children's nursery. And so growing up, they saw these characters um, on the wall of their nursery. Runjer uh, Chu Xing Ban Shan. This is from the three character classic. It's called it's three character classic or the trimetrical classic because it's in like three character verses. Bum, 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 bum. It goes on for hundreds of verses. And the very beginning of the three character classic starts out Runjer Chu at people's origin or at their beginning. Xing Ban Shan. Their natures are fundamentally good. And to this day, many people attribute to Mengzi the statement, Xing Ban Shan, the nature is fundamentally good, even though Mengzi never says that. Why do they attribute that phrase to Mengzi? Because Zhu Xi says, if you want to understand what Mengzi really means when he says human nature is good, what he means by that is that human natures are fundamentally good. Because in terms of what they're like, ultimately, your nature is the pattern, which is purely good, and everyone has the same nature. But the manifested nature, the nature as it appears manifested in qi, that's merely similar across humans. And some people like Confucius have very purified qi, so they can you know, see and manifest the pattern very uh, very pure, perfectly. Other people like Robert Jur have very turbid she, and so they're very selfish and they wallow in their human desires and their selfish desires. Most people are like Van Orden, we're somewhere in the middle. Maybe we're a little better than we could have been, but we have a long way to go to achieve complete perfection. One more thing before we close out this topic, um, I'll say a thing that people often have trouble with in understanding about pattern is, and I talk about this a little bit in uh, the, the translation of the categorized conversations of Master Jew, is that the pattern is simultaneously descriptive and prescriptive. In other words, the pattern explains why the world is the way that it is, but it also tells you how the world ought to be. So it's part of the pattern that uh, if you do not get enough sleep, if a human doesn't get enough sleep, they're going to be groggy and unfocused and their reaction time will be slow. That's a descriptive fact. Why is that true? Because given what the pattern is like, when the pattern manifests itself as a human, if you don't get enough sleep, you're gonna be sleepy. That's a descriptive fact, which follows from the nature of the pattern. Given that descriptive fact, it is prescriptively true, normatively true, that surgeons should get enough sleep before they perform surgery so that they're not groggy and unfocused and have bad hand-eye coordination. So that's one way of thinking about the relationship between the descriptive and the normative or prescriptive aspects of the pattern as manifested in the qi. Or another way to think about it is it's descriptively true that human babies cannot support themselves. They can't feed themselves. They can't get food from themselves. They can't escape predators on their own. Therefore, it is normatively or prescriptively true that human beings ought to care for infants and that they ought to love infants and feed them and protect them from dangers and things like that. So it's common in a lot of modern thought to distinguish between descriptive matters and prescriptive matters. There's a distinction that goes back to the uh, British philosopher, David Hume, it's sometimes called the is-ought dichotomy or the is-ought gap or the descriptive prescriptive gap. And people take it for granted that there's a su substantial difference between descriptive claims that describe the way the world is and prescriptive or normative claims to tell you how things ought to be. Many philosophers, including me, think this distinction is problematic, but it's a very influential one. It goes back to this Scottish philosopher, David Hume, in his treatise of human nature. But pre-modern thinkers, whether we're talking about Aristotelians and Platonists in the West, or we're talking about uh, Confucians and Taoists in uh, the Chinese tradition, the East Asian traditions, don't 
see an is ought gap or a descriptive prescriptive distinction. So for them, the pattern is both descriptive but also normative. And one more point I, I emphasized last time, but I'll emphasize it again here. Oh, if you're having trouble getting your head around pattern and chi, remember again, the notion of pattern as the Neo-Confucians use it, they're deeply influenced by the Hua Yan view where pattern is used to describe Indra's web, the web of interconnections between everything where the complete pattern is fully visible in any one thing that exists, just like every jewel in Indra's web reflects every other jewel. The complete pattern is present in any one thing that exists. But then the Confucians say, yeah, but the pattern has to be individuated. There have to be individual things that stand in the relationships given by the pattern. And the chi, the stuff that occupies space and time is what makes particular individuals. And another way of thinking about it, another way of thinking about it is that if you try to imagine pattern or structure of the universe, try to imagine the pattern or the structure of the universe, but have it not be a pattern of anything. It's hard to know what to imagine if you imagine structure without it being the structure of something. Conversely, if you try to imagine stuff, like the stuff that makes a thing up, but don't imagine that stuff as structured or patterned in any way. Just imagine stuff without having a structure or pattern. It's not clear what to imagine there either. Uh, when I try to imagine pattern or structure without a stuff, I tend to imagine like in these very geometrical crystalline patterns, but I realize when I think about it, well, I just said I'm imagining like crystals that have a nice clean structure, but still crystals are a kind of stuff. If I try to imagine stuff without it being structured, I kind of imagine this amorphous, you know, uh, like almost like um, oil in zero G, except it's undulating. But again, as soon as I say that, well, I've just given you a description of what the pattern of this thing is like. So I haven't successfully, successfully described stuff without pattern. So the underlying intuition or view here is that everything has to have a structure, but it also has to have an individuating stuff. And these things can never be separated except conceptually. We can talk about the pattern separate from the stuff. We can talk about the stuff separate from the pattern, but those things never are really separated in reality. And the Confucians think that by combining the notion of chi with the notion of pattern, they can both do justice to the Buddhist idea that everything's interrelated because we all share the same pattern, but also do justice to the fact that there really are particular individuals who have special obligations to other individuals. Like I'm an individual who owes filial piety to my parents and my children are particular individuals and I as an individual have a special obligation to them because they're my children. But I have to extend the pattern and recognize that other people's children are also children. So I should treat other people's children with love and care and give them guidance too, like I would my own, because I see the commonality of the pattern that those children share with my parents, my children, that those children share with my children. And likewise, I should be respectful for other old people I encounter, just like, because although they're not my parents, they share a common pattern with my parents. And so I should treat other old people with the same respect that I should treat um, uh, my own parents. And just to make this like really applied, I'm sure none of you have this issue. You guys seem like nice guys, but you know, sometimes what you find on, on college and university campuses is that people, the, uh, you know, both faculty, not just students, but faculty and, and staff uh, and faculty and students are often rude uh, to the staff who work at the institution. You know, or they'll, you know, they'll make a mess and not worry about the fact that, you know, some janitorial staff can have to clean that up, or they'll be rude to somebody, you know, when they're, they're buying something at the store or when they're the people who are working behind the counter. And if you just remind yourself, look, this person I'm talking to, I don't know them, but this person is somebody's son or daughter. This person may very well be somebody's father or mother. Um, this, you know, someone loves this person. And I should extend the pattern from the cases where 
I'm respectful and loving and caring for the people that are in my own life. And I should extend that pattern to the people I encounter who are old enough to be my uh, mother or father or my uncle or my aunt or just my older brother or these people, these younger kids on campus who are young enough to be my nephews or nieces and someday, you know, might be young enough to be my own kids. So it's, it's something to, to think about and ask how you might apply it in your own life. So again, this has been our lecture on the Confucian commentarial tradition. We started off by looking at how we see across multiple traditions, this pattern of classic texts, and then a period in which vibrant philosophy is done in the form of commentaries. And then with the rise of modernity, you have people who are challenging the commentarial tradition in various ways, and sometimes are rejecting the entire classical tradition. And it's very common for people in modernity to mock the classic and commentarial tradition and saying, oh, those people weren't thinking for themselves or just following the classics. But when you look at what they have to say, the, the commentarial traditions are often a site of very vibrant philosophizing. It's just the form in which they're philosophizing is in dialogue with other thinkers. And in the Chinese tradition, the original classics were the five classics that Wu Jing established in the Han Dynasty. The four books, the Su Shu, became central, more central to the Confucian system, uh, educational um, institutions with the rise of the Neo-Confucians. And as we can see, we see in Zhu Xi's writings how he applies this metaphysics of pattern and qi to interpreting the classics that have come down to him. And I don't always agree with his interpretations, but they're always really interesting. And, and in many ways, Again, one of the things that's been most exciting for philosophers like me reading these classics is they give us a way of thinking about how we might try to become better persons if we want to try to become better persons and about the interplay between our own individuality and our particular commitments to people we love in our lives and extending that love and that compassion and that respect to other people that we're not directly connected with. So thank you for listening today and I look forward to our next lecture.